So Christ is always a subject that we should consider because he is our perfect standard. He is our Savior. So let us read together from verse 13. Peter is asking the church, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the things in which they slandered you, for those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. Here comes the switch. Now we're going to see how Christ suffered. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the renewal of dirt or renewal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. As we come to our text this morning, I want to remind you of last week's sermon, and you can look at verse 18. Two things that Christ did. The first thing he did in his suffering, he purposely restored us back to God. So his suffering had purpose. It wasn't just a purposeless, let's see what happens, it might be by accident. If you look at the text there in verse 18, For Christ also died for sins, once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. The purpose of Christ's suffering is so that that we might be brought to God by Christ. This was... Why Christ came. He came to destroy the separation between us and God. He came to reconcile us to God. And look what the text says further. He willingly died, not for doing wrong, but he did a very necessary death. And while he died, he didn't die for his own sin, He died for the sins of those whom he is reconciling to God. Christ willingly died, suffered for sin that separated us from God. Romans 8 verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as 
an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. What we have here is the only presentation, the only way you can be right with God. And if you reject this way, there is no hope beyond this. There's no hope beyond this. Why? Well, look what it says in the text. Christ died once for all. So his death was sufficient for the sin of God's people. For all, because all sinned. Now, if you think you can be right with God by just being a good person, keeping some of the laws, not looking too bad, uh, that's not salvation. That's not the salvation that God gives. God gives salvation through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came, who left heaven, all the privileges He had. He took on the form of a man. He lived a holy life. He is the sinless Lamb of God. When He was placed upon the cross, He didn't die for His sin. And as He was hanging there, God pierced Him with all our sin as if He was the one who sinned. And He willingly received the punishment for it so that our sin can be punished once and for all. That's what it says. If your sin hasn't been carried away by the sinless Lamb of God, there is no hope for you, so cry out to Him and ask Him that His salvation, His provision of Himself, being the, the sinless Lamb of God in your place, before God, may be acceptable and you may be saved. Look what it says next. It also says, after it says, Christ died once for all, Christ died the just one for the unjust. In order to be saved, you must be a sinner. If you say, I'm not that bad, you are disqualified from entering into the presence of God. Now, here's the point. If the Spirit of God is at work in you, you will come to the realization there is nothing good within me. I cannot save myself. And if you have sinned once in your life, you are also disqualified. Because God expects sinless perfection. What did God do? The Lord Jesus Christ comes into this world. And there he is, the sinless Lamb of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it so beautifully. He who is God made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus takes away what we gained at the fall. We, we gain sin and guilt. Jesus takes it away at the cross. But Jesus also gives us at the cross what we lost at the fall. We lost a righteousness. You need a righteousness, not your own. And Jesus gives that righteousness so that we may enter into the presence of God. If your sin has not been removed and you have not received the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to cry out to God because that is why Christ came to suffer. Look at the last sentence of that verse. I'm just recapping. You've already heard it last week. Why did he do it? He removed your sin. He gave you a righteousness so that you may be brought to God. Christ died in order to bring us to God. Peter is saying us He's not just saying, you little Gentiles there in Turkey. No, he's saying us. He includes himself. Every single human being is totally fallen. And if you are not united to Christ, you are separated from him. And if you're not united to Christ, you are separated from God. And if that problem is not resolved, you are going to spend all eternity away from God. Hear the message today. 
Today is the day for you to hear that God has made a provision for you to be right with God, your sins to be removed, receiving a righteousness from God, being in a right standing with Him, knowing about His grace and the mercy and enjoying Him. Because if you don't, the very next verse is going to testify against you one day before the throne of God. It is talking about those who were disobedient in the day of Noah. People who heard the gospel uh, message and the message of hope for 120 years. Yes, they lived longer than we do then. It was before the flood. And they were condemned. My dear friends, just think of the kind words of this verse. Christ died in order to bring you to God. That's kind. That's kind. He has accomplished all the requirements needed to, for you to come. And when you come, and when he draws you, you are going to have confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not your own sacrifice, not your own good works. It is a completely new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil. This is his own flesh. I want to move to the second point. The title of this is called The Triumphant Sermon. The Triumphant Sermon. And I want to read from verse 18. And at first, you will maybe not see what this text is saying, but we're obviously going to unpack it. And then we are going to see how this relates to suffering. He says there, in the second part of verse 18, that Christ was uh, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. How, was, how we were redeemed? We were redeemed through his death and his resurrection. And then, the weirdest thing. Verse 19, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the waters. And he's talking here about something Christ did. After he died, his spirit was removed from his body. This is between the first and the third day when he would be resurrected. What are we talking about and how does this relate to our suffering? Having been put to death in the flesh means there is absolutely no doubt that Jesus Christ died physically on the cross. Some skeptics in our day would say, no, he only fainted on the cross. Muslims would be some of those. Atheists, agnostics, who dispute Christ's resurrection from the dead. They would say he never died in the first place. He merely fainted, and when he was in the cool of the, of the, the grave, he unwrapped himself, unwrapped himself and walked out. But that does not agree with Old Testament prophecy and with Christian orthodoxy. Jesus died physically. The Lamb of God had to die a substitutional death. If Christ did not die, there would, there would be no death to, remain our, to remove our sin. There would be a continuous looking for another sacrifice or we'll all be legalists thinking we're going to go to heaven through doing the right things. 
we will still be separated from God. We will not experience reconciliation and joy and the Spirit testifying to our spirit that we belong to God. Therefore, Jesus would be completely unsuccessful in his salvation mission if he never died. Jesus died, and when he died, he shed his blood to make us right with God. There's the next phrase, the phrase, but made alive in the Spirit. Refers to Jesus, the Spirit here, small letter, refers to the Spirit of, of Jesus. You and I are made up of an outer body and an inner man. We are body and soul. The word soul can also be translated spirit. It's the same thing. Or inner man. The Bible also talks about the heart. The, the spirit here is the disembodied spirit of Christ. The real Jesus without his body. He's not referring here to the Holy Spirit. But to the spirit, the inner man, the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ. Although, although he died, his spirit was alive. This, of course, refers to this fact that every single human being has been given a soul by God. Your soul was placed in your body by God. Your body can die, and then one day it is going to be raised. If you're a Christian, it will be raised a glorified body, that will live in God's presence for all eternity. If you are unsaved and you died, your body will also be raised, but not glorified to live forever in God's presence, but to live glorified to be able to burn for all eternity. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 speaks about the Spirit, and listen what it says. It says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has placed eternity in the hearts of humans. He has placed eternity in your soul. He has placed eternity in your spirit. Your spirit cannot die. Jesus took on a human body. He was 100% man. And here we find that his spirit did not die. And that it was made alive. But we will see in what sense he died. But not in the sense that you are thinking. So the truth of the matter is, and for your consideration, why it is important for you to come to Christ, to call upon Christ. Some of you are terrified. You are unsafe. You are terrified. You're filled with terror. You, you, you are anxious. You are depressed. You are overwhelmed. You do not believe in Christ. Don't think that when you die, that is going to dissipate. That is going to continue for all eternity because the reason why you are anxious and the reason why you are depressed and overwhelmed is because you are without Christ. You have no hope in this world. At the fall, our souls, Adam, when he sinned, took the souls of mankind into a state of fallenness. God said to Adam, if you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And what we find there is a description of a dead soul. It says they hid themselves because of fear. They were out of sync with God. Here comes the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not a sinner. He has never experienced separation from God. Christ never experienced it except once. 
He lived his life in obedience to God. They had great fellowship. There was no shame and guilt between them. And except when Christ was on the cross, our sin placed upon him and God turned his favor away from his son. Ex for the first time experiencing separation from God. An incredible blow to the soul that affected his soul as a tremendous burden, not just of Adam's sin, but all of his people are placed upon him and he is separated from the Father and he cries out, you have forsaken me, not for my personal sin, but for the sin of others, the sin of many, and he experienced the separation. And in that sense, the Spirit had to be made alive in Christ, made alive. So he didn't die in the way that we are thinking. He experienced the full blow of what it means to be a sinner and separated as Adam was separated from God when God said, if you eat of that fruit, you will die. This kind of experience or spiritual death was not a death where he ceased to exist, not that kind. But it is a death of separation, an impact that cannot be explained. We can never understand the impact that the father's punishment on his son must have had on him. The deepest and most extensive experience of separation between a holy God and his son. Jesus says, Lord, why have you forsaken me? God couldn't look at him, even though he has never sinned. Because your sin was on him. Your guilt and my guilt was upon him. Incomprehensible alienation from his father. Punishment for our sin. In our place, separated from God. So that you who believe in Christ will never be separated from him. Here's the great thing. God never punished the same sin twice. Twice. So as Christians, we have this incredible comfort when we sin that God will not punish our sin again. It was, if you're a Christian, if you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, it has been punished forever. He will discipline you, but he won't punish your sin. So he was made alive in the Spirit. After he made intercession with his body before the Father as a holy sacrifice. After his redemption of substitutionary death accomplished in our purpose when he has drunk the full cup of God's anger for our sin, he was made alive in the spirit. Which means, basically means, he was restored back into fellowship with his father. You want to be, be happy? That's maybe not a good way to say it. You want to be blessed? Pursue fellowship with God. But when you pursue it, you might first have to experience great turmoil. Because God wants you to acknowledge your sin. He wants you to realize that you need a savior. Let's come to that text, that little bit there. Then, he went and made proclamation. Jesus went and he made proclamation. The word proclamation there is he went to preach a sermon. He went to preach a sermon. 
he went and made a, uh, made a sermon to the spirits now in prison who once were disobedient. It's not the resurrection yet, but Jesus is in full fellowship with the Father. He said to the man on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. And before his spirit was reunited with his glorified body, on the third day, the spirit of Christ went, moving from one place to another place. The same word, went here, is used in verse 22 to indicate that Jesus, his, his spirit, his glorified spirit, ascended into the presence of God. So where did he go to make this proclamation? This proclamation is he went to make a triumphant announcement to a captive audience. This was done before he arose on the third day. So he went preaching. He didn't preach the gospel. This was not an occasion for gospel preaching. It literally means to preach about his triumph over Satan, sin and death. It was more of an announcement. He went to the place of God's represent. He went as God's representative to make a proclamation announcing a victory won in a battle. He didn't preach the gospel there. He didn't try to convince these the spirits there to be saved. He preached about Christ's accomplishment over sin and Satan in a manner that drew a line, established a state, and declaring to Satan and demons that were there, this is true. Christ has won. The victory is won. Satan is defeated. Through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he has triumphed over the, the, the sin and the fall. It has been dealt a deadly blow. What are we talking about here? Just a picture. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we have God making man ruler over the earth. He's ruling, he's reigning, it is absolutely beautiful. It's not the final place of destination because the garden was not protected because the serpent came into it. Adam and Eve was tempted to sin. And at that moment, when you read Genesis chapter 3, Eve saw that the fruit was good to make one wise, and what they did by eating was setting up their own kingdom. They thought they were setting up their own kingdom, but actually what happened, when they ate and disobeyed God, they came under the authority of another, which is Satan. Which is Satan. And as God in Genesis chapter 3 declares, Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, he declares war on Satan. And right that day, a cosmic war started. Listen to Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 as God is handing out the, the consequences of sin. And God says to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. He is going to completely, the Messiah is going to come, he's completely going to crush your head. He's just going to bruise him slightly, the son. And that is what happened. He disarmed Satan. Now he's going to these disobedient spirits, and we're going to look more at that, and he is making this declaration. Colossians 2.15 says, When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. 
Hebrews 2 verse 13, 14 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned. From the beginning, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And this is the announcement being made. Lines are drawn. This is what he did. Where did he go to preach? To the spirits now in prison. Not the spirit of human beings who died before Christ died for their sin. The word spirit here is never used in the New Testament to refer to human souls. So who are these spirits? Well, the background, there's this cosmic war that I spoke about that started between good and the devil and angelical forces and rages right through scripture. After Genesis chapter 4, you have two lines running parallel right through the scriptures. It is still the case. In Genesis chapter 4, Cain, the evil line, kills Abel, the righteous line. And it continues throughout Scripture. And so there is this cosmic war, and sometimes we are so reformed that we completely deformed, that we completely reject that there is a spiritual world with a spiritual war going on. Job chapter 1 verse 6 speaks about this war. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. The phrase sons of God does not mean Jesus had more, they were more saviors. Sons of God in that sense only mean those spirits that were directly created by God. They came among and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Because after he was thrown out of heaven, he's roaming the earth. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around to do his dirty work. That's my little bit. Verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and you so protect him? Take away that hedge. Let's see if he will still keep serving you. Satan says, you have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put, put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put your hand on him. Don't kill him. Because Satan has the ability to do that. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. We see there's a cosmic war. Daniel chapter 10 verse 13, there's a cosmic war. We read about, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Zechariah 3 verse 1, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand and accusing him. And you say, oh, but those are all Old Testament passages. Surely the New Testament has nothing to say about it. Ephesians 6 verse 16 says, In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. There's a spiritual war going on for your soul. He wants to destroy you. Now, after Satan's apparent victory in the Garden of Eden, when he in induced Adam and Eve into sin, and all the descendants, every single human being was fall, fell into sin, God promises the evil one that he himself 
will crush his head. God declares war, and a great war rages throughout Scripture. I've already mentioned to you Cain in chapter 4 of Genesis. So listen what I'm saying to you. Satan, through Cain's sinful, unrepented sin, kills Abel, whose offer was accepted by God. This is confirmed in John chapter 3, verse 12. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. I spoke about the parallel war going on, the righteous line and the evil line. When you read the book of Esther, what do you find in the book of Esther? You have an example of Satan working to destroy the entire nation of Israel. Why? Because the Messiah was going to be born from the nation of Israel. A decree goes out to, to all the people in the kingdom. And it sounds like this. Then were the king's scribe called in in the first month on the 19th day therefore thereof and there was written according to all that Haman Haman was this evil man that wanted to destroy the Jews commanded unto the king's satraps and to the governors that were over every providence and to the prince of every people to every province according to the writings thereof and to every people after their language in the name of king of the king was it written and it was sealed with the king's ring and letters were sent by the post into all the king's provinces to destroy to slay and to cause to perish all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day. Even upon the uh, 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey, a copy of the writings that the decree should be given out in every province was published unto all the peoples that they should be ready against the Jews on that day. Why? The Messiah was going to be born from from them, and Satan wants to destroy the Messiah. And again, we come to the New Testament, we find Herod persecuting, wanting to kill all the boys, because Satan is working through his fear to continue to have control over his little kingdom, and thousands of babies are killed. It was him. And then Satan seeks to lead Jesus into temptation in Matthew chapter 4. And you know what he uses? He twists the scriptures. And he, the last temptation is, bow down and worship me. And you can have everything. Satan even used the guy that wrote this letter. Peter was listening to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus was explaining and saying to him, I need to go up to Jerusalem to die. And on the third day I will be raised. And you know what Peter said to him? It said that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, that you should die. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Satan does not want Christ to be that intercession. And he is working here today to keep you blinded, to keep you from desiring Christ, who has come to reconcile you to God. Satan is still raging today. He will slander us to other people through the unbelieving. He will use the sin of some 
slander us. He will use, he will use others to get us to doubt God, to doubt his goodness, to shipwreck our faith. He might even tempt you to consider suicide. So that you can spend all eternity away from God. That's exactly where he wants you. He will tempt us to be steered away from a simplicity to God. He will, he will blind our family members from seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. He will tempt you to commit sexual immorality. He might even bring fleshly afflictions. He might keep your family unsaved. He might also bring diseases upon you. He will try to get you to compromise theologically. He will seek to keep you from being a godly young man. And woman. He will tempt you to do evil. He's crawling around seeking someone to devour, to, to devour. And that sin that you hold on to so dearly and think it's so wonderful, it's right, it's that that he will use to bring great harm and affliction, not only on your life, but also the life of others. Look what the text says next. These are those who were disobedient in the days of Noah. Now some in church history have said that this, this descendant or this uh, Jesus going down into hell is where he preached to the souls of men. Uh, in Afrikaans culture, we used to say it in the church that and like we had a little picture, no one really explained it to us. And it's also, it's misunderstood. Even the number one seller at Kum Books, Joyce Meyer, have stated that Jesus went down to hell to be abused in terrible ways, to be humili humiliated. Don't read that woman. That's not what happened. Jesus went to a high security prison of demons that were locked up in the day of Noah, who have led the nations astray. These verses proclaim victory and freedom to mankind, and Satan is informed about it. Now, when it speaks about the day of um, Noah, you can go read Galatians chapter 6. It speaks about things that is very hard to understand, yet it is in Scripture. Peter refers to it in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to a pit of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Here it is speaking of this place where Jesus is going to preach. The word that Peter uses there for, the, for hell is a word that comes out of Greek mythology that means it's a high security prison. It is the place where the most severe demonic criminals are kept after the flood. We read about that in Jude, verse 6 and 7. Explain their crime. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So here's a fact. It might blow your mind. There are some demons kept in this high security place who will never come out there. They were so evil Christ went to preach to them. They will never come out of there. They are reserved for judgment. But there are roaming demons. 
We do live in a world where there are evil spirits and they do take opportunity of your lack of wisdom, your disobedience, your lack of wanting to serve Christ and do what is right. Now what was their crime? Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 to 4. Now it came on the face of the land and the daughters were born to them that the sons of God, these were angels created by God, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves. Whomever they chose, the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. And, um, and of course... He cast them, uh, or he was going to bring the flood. And then it says, and because he, he also is flesh, nevertheless, his day shall be one, 120 years. And then it mentions another group, the Nephilim that were there on earth those days, um, great men of, of war. What was their sin? The sin of the demons that are locked up were those demons who cohabited with human women. This was Satan's attempt to corrupt the whole human race. The demons were already thrown out of heaven. They would take possession in human bodies. And they amount attack on God-ordained marriage and, and procreation and influence those generations with such evil that God had to destroy the whole generation. So these are perverse demons stepped out of their spiritual realm into the human realm, similar to Satan who entered an animal in Genesis chapter 3. And these demons would enter human bodies and children, it says in the text, children were born from them. Jesus goes and he proclaims and he draws the line. You have no authority. I've overcome you. Incredible moment of putting victory on display but see in, in a place where no one can go. I need to make an application. There's still so much to say. Here's my application. Some of you might have been exposed to the deliverance ministry of people that want to deliver you of a demon or a generational curse. Those people try to do what Jesus did. They cannot, they do not have the authority to do it. They try to imitate what Jesus did, what Jesus alone can do. They try to declare territories clean. They try to bind and to expel and to send away. No, only Christ. Only Christ has the authority. Jesus alone did this. Now I'm saying it because some of you are tampering with that stuff. It's because you are ignorant. You do not understand scripture. Nor does this mean that every Christian have been given the authority to stand on serpents and to expel demons and to bring healing. No, that belongs to Christ. Well, what about the 70, you might say? Well, consider the context. Jesus, the king, was on earth. He's showing what his kingdom will look like one day. It was his disciples who were given this. And the reason they were given it is so that people may know that they were with Christ. That was a description of what it meant for Christ to be. It wasn't a prescription that the church should have these kind of people in them. Jesus alone can set the captive free. He can bind the demon. Now here's the warning. If you reject Christ and his work and his word, it is inevitable that you will listen to demons, the teaching of demons. Paul writes that to Timothy. He'll be led astray. 
staying in the realm of generational curses and the deliverance ministry, there's teaching going on that demons can be sent down generations one to another and Exodus will be quoted, the sins of the fathers to the first sec- of, um, the, the second and third generation. That's not what it means. It simply means that if you as a father or a mother choose to live in sin before your children, those sins are going to be evident in their lives and in their children's lives. So repent of your sin because it's going to affect three generations of your family. Jesus made a stop to all of this. If you come to Christ, you're a new creature. You don't need to go for deliverance. Because it is God who transfers you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. No man can do that. I learned it the the hard way. I was in that ministry. I went for deliverance. And you know the night before I read Ezekiel 18. It says that the fathers will not be guilty for the sins of the sons and the sons will not be guilty for the sins of the fathers. Guess what happened? I was free. Why? Because I simply believe the word of God. That if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. But here's a question. How does this information relate to the context which is all about suffering? This section comes in a portion of scripture where the main theme is suffering, which means Christians are going to continue to suffer in this world, even though Jesus has made declaration. The act of God here, of Christ, in this context, does not automatically free you and me from suffering. Here's another example, another application. Don't think that when you suffer as a Christian for righteousness sake, that Satan is getting the upper hand. Stop calling other people an instrument in Satan's hand. Stop doing that. Satan cannot get the upper hand. But even if he does, it's God, Satan. And God can use Satan for his purposes as he did in Acts chapter 2 when according to the predetermined plan of God, Jesus was, was put to death and God was totally in control. Satan is under God's rule and subservient to him. As someone famous said, he's on a leash and God will allow him if it serves God's purposes. We've spoken about free roaming demons. Plunge yourself in the scriptures. Run to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do they seek to get us? They want to deceive you in believing lies. They want to deceive you in twisting the gospel. They want you to listen to different gospels. Deception. They take the truth and they twist it and twist it and twist it. And they use your sin. They also want to tempt you. What can they tempt you by? They tempt you through the sin that is already in your heart. They tempt you with your sin. When you listen to them, you reject the word of God. They will accuse you before people, and they will accuse you before God. If you are here this morning, and you realize you're in trouble, let me say, run to Christ. He is your protector. When you go to Christ... You stand behind him. You are with him who has authority over all things. He will protect you. But listen to this secondly. The church, a Bible-believing church, is your protection. Unlike the bound demons 
that are mentioned, they're roaming, they hate authority, they cannot come under authority. Coming to Christ and joining a Bible-believing church is your protection. It doesn't mean Satan is not going to come in here. No, even from among our own selves will arise rebels, infused and encouraged by him. But as the church is of one mind and stand together on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be defeated. Two things we've looked at. Jesus came to bring us to God. We saw that in verse 18. Secondly, Jesus came to destroy the work of Satan and demons and sin and death. But be warned, he will use your unrepentant sin to accomplish his purposes here and in your family and out in the world. Will you trust and obey and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ? It is your only rescue. That's your only safeguard. There is no other. No other. Next week we will look at his supremacy who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after the angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. They are all subject to Christ. He rules over everything that is ever made. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you could do what we could never do. That you did it. You died a death to bring us to God. You proclaimed and declared authority and rule and reign over Satan. You having all authority and power. Lord, you know how vulnerable we are. You know how prone we are to love the God that we say we love. You know our struggles, each one of us here. And where we give Satan a foothold. When we get angry, or when we are tempted to look at explicit images, or when we compromise on truth, when we complain and are not thankful and say it would be better to be dead. And when we do things that are just contrary to Christ. <coughs> Lord, help us to repent of the desires that rage within us. So that Satan may have a foothold. Help us to cling to Christ, to love him everything that he has done. And if there's anyone here this morning who has heard the word, let them not be like the disobedient,